Hello, Critical Thinking Classroom. How are you today? Good morning. I'm so happy that you are here. If you are here joining me, make sure I have you on public because I didn't have you on public before. And so nobody was joining me before in my bookless classroom. And if you didn't join me in my bookless classroom, I would just like you to make some time to get in there today, even though you didn't get to see the live version of me. It was pretty good. I had a lot of really good information there. So if you're a history buff, especially an American history buff, I would say get into my bookless classroom. I had it unlisted and it's just, you know, <clears throat> one of those things. You say use the old, use the last things that I use, the last selections I use. I've never had an unlisted selection. How it's using the last selection I used as unlisted, I don't know. Likely to aggravate me, but I can't be so easily aggravated, right? Okay, let me, um, I'm going to open up that window behind me a little bit more, get a little bit more of a breeze in here, so I'll be right back. Hold on. Normally, I would ask the crew to go ahead and do that and get this room set up so I had a little bit of a breeze in here before I got started, but, you know, the crew's on kind of a limited schedule. I'm so happy I did that because I let out a little butterfly that was trapped there from when I had the windows open yesterday. Oh, that's a nice fresh air in here, which I like. I also have a attic fan. Look it up. It gives me a breeze. I barely ever use my air conditioning. I live in Michigan. We've been having some hot days. It's the end of May. And it had to be, I don't know, I don't pay attention, but it had to be 90 yes, the other day. Not yesterday, day before. Maybe not. <clears throat> Maybe it was, but it was certainly in the 80s. For sure it was in the 80s. Okay, let's get going. We don't care. This is not the weather report. I'm not the teacher about the weather. I'm not a meteorologist. I am Dr. Annette Farovich here with Healthy Mind, Body, Spirit. I'm here as a teacher. We're in the classroom. That's where we are. My business is healthy, mind, body, spirit. But we're in the classroom right now. And I'm the teacher. Let's get to these. I've been promising Erickson psychosocial stages of development <clears throat> for a very long, for, for a long time. For a few classes, I've been promising this. And uh, here it is. Here it is. We will likely get to it. Now, let me, let me sort of warm you up on what we're here for again. So we are here in this critical thinking classroom. We call it a critical thinking classroom, but really what we are is we really are around high school age is where we're at. Around high school age, sorry about that. That probably doesn't look good. I had to get my lotion for my hands. Um, so around high school age, and we're getting high school students to mainly think about themselves. I know it's really difficult to get them to do that, but you know what? You work with what you got. So we're getting them to think about themselves and the developing of the self. We as in me and the whole crew as in I. So what I am giving you here now is, remember, this whole thing really did start with self-esteem. This is a giant chunk of a lesson that we have here. I don't know. Maybe it goes on forever. Who knows? I'm not sure. But the self-esteem rolled into feelings of self-worth, which rolled into attraction, which rolled into attachment, right? And then we started looking at adult attachment, a few other things in there. But those were the main concepts that we have here. And, and 
what we've been really talking about, and we hit this in the philosophical classroom, probably a little bit stronger tomorrow, is what, how do these develop? How can I develop in a way that I really know myself? I feel confident about who I am, right? How do we develop that self so that I'm self-assured and maybe I can even help overcome my own anxiety or my own depression if I've got the right tools. How do I develop that self? So we've talked about some of the things that go into self-esteem, for example, or feelings of self-worth or attachment styles, right? Now I'm kind of getting a little bit more to the nuts and bolts of what this is really about. What is the, what, what are some real um, <clears throat> tangible is the word I always use, touchable, real practical ways that I could begin to feel a little more confident. So we're going to look at Erickson's psychosocial stages of development. It gives us another description. <clears throat> so maybe not the answer is what I'm saying. It's another description of who you are in these stages. However, when we figure out who we are in those stages, what that does is, is it gives us a great answer to where we need to go. Just like we were talking yesterday in the attribution retraining. When we have an idea of our self-talk and exactly what it is, is it internal? Is it external? Is it stable? Is it unstable? Is it global? Is it specific? If you don't know what I'm talking about, look at the last three lessons that we've had and you'll have a much better idea and, and go a little bit before that if you want to even know more. I have been mowing my lawn and because we have those people who are doing the lawn lay down all that fertilizer. I have all kinds of dry grass around here that I've been getting up with my rake because it's so deep down in the grass. It's not a cut. It's deep down dry, dead hay grass is what they've been doing over here. And it's really, it's fine because I really am getting some really good exercise out there. And, and why do I tell you all this? A lot of times I tell you all these PS things. There are reasons. There's a method to my madness. It's about being engaged. It's about being engaged and it's about problem solving. Right now I have some real problems on my property and I need to problem solve about those properties. I need to become active about my property here. I need to be actively engaged in getting these problems solved in my on my property. And that means I'm getting physical exercise. It means I literally am engaging my brain because I'm problem solving. I am learning all kinds of things about my property and, and not just about my property, about, but about what I can do physically. I'm really surprised. I showed it my some of my plants that I had planted yesterday in the early bird classroom. So go to the early bird classroom and you'll see those plants and, and much of the work that I've been doing on the property. And I decided that that's how I'm going to get my exercise right now. Like normally I would take walks and it clears my head and I'm very sad that I haven't been able to take my walks like I used to take my walks, but nevertheless, It'll work out. It'll be okay that I can't take my walks because why? Because I'm engaging in my property and uh, it's not, you know, the best piece of property, but it's pretty good, but it's a pretty good piece of property. And I like to keep, um, I like to keep it up right now. I have a plumbing issue because three times that the people were out here to help do something out here with some other tree service, see my mysteries. They have destroyed both of my faucets. So here I'm doing all this yard work, but I don't have a way to water it. And I don't have a plumber that I trust at all. So if you want to know a plumber in the Michigan area that you know that won't take advantage of a woman or won't try to, you know, take advantage of her sexually, let me know. Let me know. Because all of them right now are just looking, you know, to get laid. <laughs> They're just looking to get laid.
and that they don't want to do anything with you or help you out if they can't get laid. Sorry, but you guys are in high school and you need to know this and you need to know that there are those predators out there and they prey on people who are not confident. They prey on people who have low self-esteem. They prey on people who um, are not engaged socially with people or in their life. They have anxiety. They have depression. They have special radar for those vulnerable populations, and they take advantage. This is not just about a small psychology class of finding yourself. It's not about that. It's about actively getting engaged in a healthy journey. That's what this is about, all right? So, and let me tell you, out of all the classes, you are getting the nuts and bolts like none of the other classes. So keep coming to the critical thinking classroom to really get these great strategies. Remember where we started. We literally did start with, here's a development of my mind, Bloom's taxonomy, whatever topic we're coming at from, you want to make sure that you have, um, that you are calling up memory, that you are understanding, that you are applying, that you are um, evaluating. You are doing all of this Bloom's taxonomy. It's why we still have it up there. All of this is building on one another. Here, this is for our mental capacity, right? Who do you want to be? You want to be the best that you can be. These are the things that we're focusing on. Do you know to focus on hedonic happiness or do you know to focus on eudaimonic happiness? That was at the beginning of this lecture, right? And we started talking about that actually at the very beginning, I, I believe on May 6th. Here are so many of those practical surveys that I've been giving you to be able to help you really identify. And the more you identify, as we've said, the more that you begin to identify your self-talk, examples of self-talk here, examples of self-talk here, the more that you identify your self-talk, stop. Stop yourself. Listen to your inner voice. I can't not even tell you how often I have to say it. My husband had the most vicious self-talk. Oh my gosh. It used to make me sad when I would hear his voice out loud because it's self-talk, right? So it's not very often that you hear that voice out loud, but I would hear it underneath his breath. And then, by the way, I heard my son doing it all the time as well. My younger son all the time. Come on, get your head in the game. Come on, what's the matter with you? What? I would hear him do that all the time. In both cases, it broke my heart. It's so hard at the moment in time to explain to somebody what they're doing. And sometimes the last people that want to listen to your psychological advice is your family. Thank you very much, right? But so, so you can't stop in the moment and say, hey, your self-talk really sounds, you know, horrible. Can we change it up to, the, you know, at that moment in time, it's just like, you know, do that. And then you get the big F you right there, right? So you're going to have to really likely be the changer of your own self-talk. People really don't know enough about self-talk to be able to educate somebody else. The best you really likely can do is educating yourself on your own self-talk, which is an amazing um, skill. It's an amazing skill to listen to your own self-talk. Okay, and so there are there's our other measure. Um, and again, that measure, you can take a look at those measures and think about. We can measure self-talk from years ago and then find out how your health is today, right? So I look at I look at your, your self-talk from, as we said, uh, uh, athletes. And what did they say after they won a game? A good outcome? What did they, what was their self-talk after they lost a game? A bad outcome, right? And if you remember, we were talking about those good and bad outcomes when we were talking about the attribution style questionnaire, right? So more questionnaires that we have here to help you really get up to speed on that self-talk. 
It is so important because it is the foundation for you to be able to turn that self-talk around. I think that if people realized, and it was amazing to me that my that my husband, you know, in his 50s, didn't even notice his own self-talk, right? And under his breath would, would say it, right? So, and I think that if, and when he heard it, it's appalling. If I said to you, you call yourself stupid, people are appalled by that. But in your self-talk, you do it to yourself all the time, right? Come on, what's the matter with you? Why can't you get this together? Self-talk. Why can't you, come on, why can't you get this together? Bad event, stable attribution, likely also global, your fault. Very pessimistic statement. So right there, it's not just simply that we have identified you're a pessimist. We've identified how you're a pessimist. Internal, external, stable, unstable, global, specific. We've identified how your pessimism works. And if we identify how your pessimism works, we can change that pessimism. We can change it, okay? Again, this ASQ gives us hope scales and self-esteem scales. You can look for Attribution Style Questionnaire by Martin Seligman. You can also email me if you're interested in getting that as well. My email, I think I have this on the, on the previous page, so I'm going to go there. My email address, if you want any of those surveys or if you're interested in a little bit more information, let me know. Let me know how what you think your self-talk is, and then um, and then we can go from there, right? Come on, get it on there. Dr. Dr. Period Ferovich, F is in Frank, E R A, V as in Victor, I C H at healthy mind body spirit.net. So if you are interested in any of those surveys that I had there, if you are wondering about your optimism or pessimism level. Or if you think you have an idea about your self-talk, but you're not quite sure about how you want to attack your self-talk, all of those things you can email me about, and I can give you some direct answers. Dr. Dr. Period Ferovich, F as in Frank, E-R-A, V as in Victor, I-C-H, at HealthyMindBodySpirit.net. Okay. I wonder if I've got this yet. There we go. All right, so those are specific ways that you can generate a, a better, better self-talk. And remember, when you have better self-talk, what are we literally improving? Literally, we are improving your hope or your outlook on life. And when we improve your outlook on life, you see things more positively. When we do that, that gives you more self-confidence. It allows you to interact with other people more often. You will end up disclosing more personal information and that's a two-way street. When you disclose, another person naturally discloses as well, right? So you will begin to, when you identify that self-talk, one way to begin to literally change your pessimistic attitude to an optimistic one. Now you're like, Dr. Ferovich, really? Well, you know, it's one step in the process, but it's a very, very big step. It is one that we may not be able to overcome if we don't always, if we don't feel it here, if we never feel it here, if we never feel it here. Attribution retraining is about changing the way that you think, right? What comes up from here is the self-talk. It's the feeling about myself that brings about the self-talk. Through training, I can stop that behavior and that self-talk. But 
if I feel it deep in here, it's going to be really hard. If I really do think, comparatively speaking, I'm stupid, it's going to be really hard to change that self-talk that's constantly saying, oh, you're so stupid. Okay? We have lots of reasons to do it. We have lots of reasons to change that self-talk. Here's a GPA example that I gave yesterday, along with a list of things that optimism and pessimism affects. I get this coffee. I get, you know, yeah, I'm not saying it on air. It gives you the wrong impression. I really want to get a little bit more of my coffee, if you don't mind. Um, I just want to get a little bit more of my coffee. But let me, before I get more of my coffee, I'm going to put up these developmental assets. Oh, here, yeah, don't forget that here we've got um, the consequences of hostility, physical consequences of hostility. And don't forget, we were looking at that with our personality variables. There are our five personality measures for our big five, right? And we use the acronym OCEAN in order to find out about the big five. Okay, I am going to refill my coffee. This, and I'm going to let you look at all of this information for a minute. Uh, and what we are looking at here is... Uh, if you went to that link right there, you would get a list of developmental assets. And in fact, I'm really surprised that I didn't give you, well, I do have the list of developmental assets there, but I didn't give you the, um, the link. So, which, which I'm getting ready right now for you. I want to give you that link. So, Okay, so you actually literally, I just literally put the PDF right down there for you. And so that is a link to the PDF. And I'm going to, although it really makes me mad because it just, just doesn't generate. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. Oh, I can't. Hold on, just give me one second.
Okay. All right. Yeah, we've I've got my volume on now too. There is the developmental asset checklist. And so you could see here on this checklist that there are 40 different items. And all this is, is a checklist. That's it. Either you have that on your list or not. That's, it's just that simple. So number one there, let me get my glasses on. I receive high levels of love and support from family members. You either do or you don't. That's what this developmental asset checklist is. So many people find it helpful to use a simple checklist to reflect on assets young people experience. This checklist simplifies the asset list to help prompt conversation in families, organizations, and communities. Note, this checklist is not intended nor appropriate as a scientific or accurate measure of developmental assets. <clears throat> But that being said, it has been used. So you can see there, it is developmental assets by the Search Institute down there, and there are 40 developmental assets. Again, you just check the list. I am optimistic about my future. Either you are or you aren't. Neighbors take responsibility for monitoring my behavior. Either happens or it doesn't. I tell the truth even when it's not easy. You either do or you don't. Now, again, I care about my school. These are subjective, right? Nobody's saying, no, that's the wrong answer. You gave the wrong answer or you're lying or anything. This is just for you. It's for you. Be as honest as you can because the results really are to help you and nobody else. So we take a look at that developmental asset checklist. If you want a copy, uh, I've got the link down there below, a PDF. It is literally that simple. But let's take a look at what we find out from it after the fact. All right. So, whoops. So here... What we find here is, is that what are these developmental assets? They, you can clearly see these are assets that you have, which protects us from life's problems. The asset actually, the asset list, those are samples, but the asset list is really 156 items. Out of 156 items, the average number on, on uh, um, that, that, actually have a list of internal or external assets there. So the original list has got in external assets. You can see some of those external assets, family support, positive family communication, other adult relationships. Here we can see creative activities, youth programs, um, time at home, those are external assets that can help you. Some internal assets that can help you is, do you have self-esteem? Are you, re do you have resistance skills? Do you know how to resolve conflicts peacefully? Are you motivated to achieve? Do you think you are a caring individual? You can see that these are internal assets. They are things that I have and develop, like caring, that I develop on the inside of me, or like feelings of self-esteem. So feelings that I develop on the inside of me. Now, the Search Institute has got used 40 developmental assets. When you've got the 40 as opposed to the whole 156 items, using the 40 items on average, the average number of items that people checked was 18. Boys on average usually have about 16.5 uh, assets and girls have a few more assets. On average, about 19.5 for the overall average being about 18. It is not strongly related. So the number of developmental assets that you have is not strongly related to your family income. Again, very similar to the um, adaptive mental mechanisms, which reminds me, we didn't finish that, that topic off yet either. So we've got to actually finish a couple of those things off. 
are those in this one or not? No, they're not. Never mind. That's in phil uh, philosophical class. So family income, it's not related to. Similar in smaller towns as in urban areas. So big cities, small towns. But it does say that urban youth are in the lower, that are in the lower income have 3.5 fewer assets. So it's a little bit confusing there. It says that assets aren't related to low income except for low income youth, low income youth. So there we have an age and we have a, so it's a combination of both age and, um, and income, age and income. It's a combination of both of those things that create fewer developmental assets. All right, let me make that larger so I can see it myself. Uh, on average, two thirds of the community have fewer than 20 assets. On average, about 66% of our communities have fewer than 20 assets. You can see that those are community assets, right? My neighbors keep an eye on me. And as, as assets rise, Reductions occur in alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drug use, early sexual activity, violence, violent, vi violent antisocial behavior, and gambling. As the number of assets that you have rise, uh, undesirable behaviors decrease and desirable behaviors increase. Okay? So... You have an idea of what those assets are, right? There's an idea. This gives you an idea of what those assets are. You could find more of those 156 assets, but this is just uh, the 40 that the Developmental Institute uses. You really likely don't need more than that. If you have higher than average, you know the average is 18. You know what they are for girls. You know what they are for boys, right? So that really gives you a good indication of how successful you're going to be based on the number of assets that you have directly from this 40 asset checklist sheet. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the results here. So you could see here in the, um, legend over there that individuals, so the number of assets they are using that 40 item checklist. So you can see that the dark green represents people who have assets, 31 to 40 assets, people who have 21 to 30, it's in the lighter green, 11 to 20, it's in the, the lime green, and zero to 10, it is in the yellow, yellow green color, right? So dark green, more assets, 89% of those individuals who had between 31 and 40 assets that are listed there on this asset checklist, right? If you have between 31 and 40 assets, you are going to be more diversified in your values. You're going to have greater leadership skills. You are going to have experience less violence and less drug use. Do you see that? And do you see how the fewer assets, zero to 10 assets, those individuals, 39% of those individuals experience more values diversity. What does that mean? What does values diversity mean? It means that I have a lot of different values that I can talk about and I feel passionately about, about, I value teaching, I value nurturing, I value land, I value creation, I value the environment, right? I value a delicious cup of coffee in the morning, right? So lots of things that I could list. I value my family, I value my job, and my work that I do, right? So I could list a lot of things. Do you have a lot of diversity or is all of your value in playing computer games? Is all of your value in your phone and your interactions on your phone? Do you see how one, 
with being involved in all of the things that are around us could likely give us greater health, better health, right? Because we are involved, we're in the environment, we're getting our vitamin D, we're, we're conversing, we're using our brain, right? We are feeling emotions, getting stirred up. All of those things create value for us, all right? All right, let's look at the next slide. Same thing, 31 to 40 assets, dark green, and now we're looking at undesirable behavior. So who has the most undesirable behavior? Zero to 10 assets. 62% of those individuals with only zero to 10 assets from that asset checklist that we have right there, that 40 item asset checklist, 62% are involved in hitting others. 55%, I'm sorry, 34% are involved in tobacco use. That is significantly dropping. I think 20% of individuals smoke cigarettes now. 55% are involved in alcohol use and 49% in shoplifting if you only have between zero and 10 assets. I can't imagine somebody having zero assets there that you can't say one of those things is happening for you and you could see how then those environmental conditions would really affect the lives of these individuals here we are looking at positive uh, behaviors sexual sexual abstinence so you're not having casual sex you're not having hookups look at people between 31 and 40 assets 94 percent of them are staying abstinent or, or relatively abstinent, right? One person kind of thing. Although abstinence has no sex. So what, so yeah, you can take it from there. School success, 54% who have between 31 and 40 assets have success in school. That they are involved in helping others 96% of the time. And they have a spiritual commitment 79% of the time when they are when they have checked off 31, between 31 and 40 assets. Okay, all right, let's get to then our main discussion for today, which is Erickson's psychosocial uh, stages of development, all right? So I'm gonna have you go ahead and quick look at that for a minute before I draw it back and explain some of those things on that chart to you. In fact, I might just, I'm gonna leave it up there for like that for a little bit. So you can see that there in the colorful uh, blocks there, those are stages. And you can see that each stage has a name, trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, identity versus role confusion, intimacy versus isolation, generativity versus stagnation, and integrity versus despair. And so you can see at each one of these stages, what we have is what Erickson called a conflict. That versus in their trust versus mistrust, identity versus or industry versus inferiority, right? Intimacy versus isolation. What each one of those stages suggest with the verses is that there is a conflict at each one of those stages. You can see that each one of those stages is age related too. That optimally, we would likely be experiencing that stage or that conflict, if you will, at that age range. And when we are successful in the conflict, we, have, we end up with a virtue. So if I'm successful in the trust versus mistrust, what I end up getting is I build my foundation for trusting relationships. And the virtue or the outcome is listed there all the way to uh, on the outside. So the age is first listed. Then the critical relationship that is occurring at that stage. And then finally is the virtue that you acquire 
if you go through that stage successfully. So in the first example, or in the first psychosocial stage, you can see that we have trust versus mistrust is the conflict. This occurs between ages zero and one month of age. So that's when we typically experience this conflict. The resolution for the conflict involves a social relationship. That's the reason why Erickson is calling this, these stages, psychosocial stages. At every stage, we have got a conflict where in that conflict, to help us get through it, we need to have a positive relationship with that um, individual or group that is listed there in between the age range and the virtue there, all right? And so the virtue in the end is what we acquire if we go through that stage in a healthy way. If our mom's in the first stage, because that is the critical caregiver, the critical relationship there. Ooh, we'll go this way. The critical, this way. The critical relationship is there in the middle between the virtue and between the age right there. So we've got a conflict, trust versus mistrust, right? We've got that conflict. And then we've got a person we depend on in order to get over that conflict successfully. If we do, we get a virtue that is acquired during this age range. Okay? All right. So let's go then to the very first conflict and let's go through that conflict a little bit more specifically. All right. So the first conflict that is listed there is trust versus mistrust. What are you doing between the ages of zero and one? What are you doing between the ages of zero and one? Let me hear it. Not much of anything, right? Not much of anything. You are getting fed, you're getting your diapers changed, and you are getting comforted, right? Sleeping, you are finding comfort. All of that relies on a caregiver who is present and meeting the needs of that infant. That infant gets changed when that infant cries and is wet or is dirty. That infant gets fed when that infant is hungry, that infant gets caressed and touched and nurtured when that, in order for that infant to find pleasure, right? In order for that infant to not cry, to not be afraid, right? So the infant is dependent on a really trustworthy caregiver who responds to the infant needs. Typically, that is the mother. The mother has all kinds of reasons to be a good caregiver, right? That her offspring survives. And we find that mothers are much better nurturers than fathers are. Fathers engage in rough and tumble play. They're better at playing than moms are. Moms are better at nurturing. You get a good mother nurturing her child. That child learns trust. When you have a mother who is distant, who is preoccupied, right? Who is fearful about parenting, you get a child who is untrustworthy. And that's the beginnings of the attachment styles. The attachment styles that say that basically I am... Uh, that, or that I can't trust somebody is going to meet my needs and therefore I become what? I'm looking for the attachment styles is what I'm looking for. 
Okay, so if you're wondering. And therefore I become what? I become fearful of relationships. I become preoccupied with relationships. I become clingy and needy. I become uh, authoritarian. I don't need them. I don't need relationships, right? This is when we become, this is when we engage in unhealthy attachments, when we have insecure attachment styles. All the other attachment styles, we have secure, all the other ones are insecure attachment styles. So if we have an insecure attachment style, where is the beginning of that insecure attachment style? In infancy. With what? With developing trust with our caregiver that when she leaves, she'll return. That she'll meet my needs. That she'll nurture me. That's why I'm sad when she leaves. And that's why I'm so happy and easily contented when my mother comes home. All right? It is the foundation. And when somebody is experiencing these other attachment styles, these adult insecure attachment styles, such as dismissing, look at that uh, description there, right? In that description, you really are getting an untrust, an untrusting adult. I am comfortable without close relationships. It is very important for me to feel independent and self-sufficient. I don't trust anybody else to make me feel independent and self-sufficient. And I prefer not to depend on others or have others depend on me. That's because I can't trust them right? So we see the foundations of these lifelong relationships beginning in these attachment styles. I want to be completely emotionally intimate with others, but I find that others are reluctant to get clo as close as I would like. I am uncomfortable being without close relationships, but I sometimes worry that others don't value me as much as I value them. I can't trust them. I'm always thinking about relationships because I can't trust them. I'm trying to figure them out. The last one, I am uncomfortable getting close to others. I want emotional, emotionally close relationships, but I find it difficult to trust others completely or to depend on them. I worry that I will be hurt if I allow myself to become too close to others. That is a statement completely revolving around feelings of trust. I do not trust other people to meet my needs. And when I am afraid, I am afraid because I can't trust others to do that. When I'm afraid in particular in relationships. Okay, let's move on. To the next conflict that we have. So our next conflict is, it occurs between two and three years of age. Almost there. I should have went the other way. Oops. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. Autonomy is a feeling of I am independent, that I can make my own choices. What does a child start doing at about the age of between one and three? Well, first of all, they start saying no, 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 don't take away that toy. No, I want that piece of cookie. No, no, no. That is the infant asserting their self, asserting their personality, asserting who they are. They are making independent choices. No, I want to keep running in the house with scissors, right? Or whatever. So they want to keep making independent choices. They begin hiding some of their wrong choices because they want to make independent choices, right? 
Why are they hiding? Because of the other side of this conflict, they experience when they do wrong, they experience shame and doubt. At about the age of three, what infants are doing is, is they are determining, are they a good girl or a, a good boy, or are they a bad girl and a, or a bad boy? And I know that those aren't appropriate terms to be using with our children. I really tried really hard not to describe my children as bad, right, ever. Like that was bad, what you did was bad, no. But, you know, it's not so critical. I mean, it is. You can't describe everything a child does as bad, right? You have to give some compliments. But saying that something that they do is bad might actually be true. A behavior is bad, not the child. And that's the differentiation that people are trying to make or psychologists try to make, is that make sure you're not calling the child bad. Make sure that you're calling the act bad. But what happens? Why does a child hide those bad behaviors because they experience shame and doubt. Now, another thing that's going on between one and three is that they are getting potty trained. So when, think about parents who could be very punitive, very punishing during potty training. They might do that because they need to get their child potty trained in order for that child to be able to go to daycare, for example. Some daycare centers won't take your child unless they're potty trained. So a, so a parent can get sort of very anxious about potty training their child and then start using more and more punishment, right? You better, you better, you better. So now I begin to feel embarrassed about what? About a behavior that is very natural. Going to the bathroom is a behavior that is very natural. But now you're yelling at me about it. And now I'm getting punished about it. And there are rules about it. And I feel like I'm failing those rules. And the more anxious I get, the more I'm liable to wet the bed or have accidents. So during this time, they are beginning to, children are beginning to make their own choices. Are the parents always punishing them or are the parents rewarding them? when they when they assert themselves make their own decisions that are right that is then autonomy so when you support the child's decisions right that are correct you build autonomy in that child again that's from ages 1 to 3 what is the relationship now it's both parents because both parents are doing correcting and modeling of behavior right and we need to go back to both of those um, virtues that are being received. So hope, I have the hope. Why is it trust and mistrust ends up with the virtue of hope? Because I hope for mature relationships. I hope that somebody will trust me and I trust them. When I have hope, I take chances and those chances mean I can trust the outcome. Choice for the virtue, right? I am deciding for stage two, conflict number two, what is right and wrong? Am, am I going to get punished? And the virtue there is that I know how to make the right choices. Those virtues are just really, I think, theoretically phenomenal, theoretically uh, really genius and creative. I'll explain more about why I think that about Erickson's theory, but I do wish that there were more uh, psychologists and researchers, uh, um, real sincere scientists who are looking more into those virtues because what else do we want to develop except for hope, choice, those kinds of things. And so why haven't we studied how to develop them if we believe that they are valuable virtues. And we do. And we do. This is Dr. Annette Ferovich. I am the teacher. You are here in the classroom. Thanks for being here for the Critical Thinking Classroom. I will see you tomorrow and we will finish off those Erickson's Psychosocial Stages of Development. Thanks for joining me.